Hi there, I'm Sarah Cunnington. Welcome to Drawn from the Word. Faith is a funny thing. Lots of people claim to have faith and to be sustained by it, but when you probe a little deeper, you find such a strange array of faith objects that it's clear their faith is more about superstition and even fear. There are also a multitude of religious systems and a multitude of faiths, very diverse faiths. So who is right and who is wrong? It's a huge question and although I can't presume to answer it in its entirety, it's what I will be looking at today. So why don't you join me? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Things not seen. That sounds a bit vague, doesn't it? A bit pie in the sky to some. Certainly many people struggle to put their trust in something unseen and for the most part unknown. So they turn to rabbit's feet, horseshoes, lucky numbers and holy medals. They touch wood and never walk under ladders. They also put their faith in their feelings, their abilities and their bank balance, even in their positive thinking. But this begins to lead us back into uncertain territory, such as the world or other world, of gurus and healers, esoteric wisdom and mantras, spirit guides, and then the desperate deception of contacting or trying to contact dead loved ones. You may have heard the argument about such people being really sincere. You have to respect their sincerity. The only problem is they are sincerely wrong. However exclusive this statement may sound, these things have nothing to do with true faith. They are false friends, idols that give hollow comfort when the chips are down. They also raise a huge problem when we do decide to ask God for help. Messing around with faith in other things, other than the one true God, creates a blockage when we want to turn to him for help. That is why so many people's prayers remain unanswered. He's not to blame, we are. He has declared that he alone is God and we must have no other gods before him. If we want our creator God to answer our prayers, we need to be serious in renouncing any false faith we have in created or imagined things. The same can even be said of some Christian beliefs. Maybe that shocks you, but the truth is that many people who count themselves as Christians limit their understanding of God by fixating on one aspect and one alone of his immeasurable nature. Some people only know of Jesus as a baby in his mother's arms. How can such a weak and powerless infant help them? For others, the image of Jesus eternally dead, eternally hanging from the cross, encourages them to call on the dead for help, an anathema to God. The infant Jesus and the crucified Christ are essential to who Jesus is, but the God who came in weakness to identify with our weakness grew up 
to be a perfect, compassionate and miracle-working man. The Christ who hung on the cross and died for our sins was raised to life by the power of Almighty God. Jesus took on himself the death that we deserve so that we could share his life. And this is the resurrected Christ who ascended into heaven where he reigns for eternity and where we will share his eternal life. So coming back to where I began, the true test of faith is actually about who or what we put our faith in. Faith in anything but the one true God is a deception, a deadly deception, like mist that fades as the sun rising having led us into a swamp that will swallow us up. However, even a small amount of faith in the one, true, great and glorious God, that is totally life-transforming. In Matthew 17, Jesus says this, Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I've heard people dismiss these words saying this could never happen or at best this is figurative speech. However, there's a wonderful testimony of the faith of a group of children living in a Christian orphanage in Japan whose faith literally moved a mountain. Because of building and health and safety regulations, the number of children who could be housed in the orphanage was limited. They were already at maximum capacity when they heard of a little orphaned family who were in desperate need of a home. They'd already sought to extend the building but it was not possible to go up because of earthquake regulations. It was not possible to extend outwards either, because the orphanage was cheek by jowl with its neighbouring houses, and the back of it was built right up against a hill or rocky outcrop. There was nothing that could be done. Their hands were tied. However, the children were so moved by the plight of the little family that they held a prayer meeting. No grown-ups were present, just the children. They got down on their knees and pleaded with God to move the mountain and make it possible for the orphan children to come and join them. Then they all left to go off on their annual holiday. When they returned two weeks later, to their amazement and joy, the hill behind the building had completely disappeared. What had happened in the meantime was this. The municipal council of this little seaside town had realised for some time that their port was too small. It was vital to enlarge it. To a great extent, their economy depended on the trade it brought in. But the geography of the town limited increasing the size of the harbour. The only option was to extend into the sea, but that would require an immense amount of rock. Then someone remarked that there was rock within the envelope of the town, the hill that stood directly behind the Christian orphanage. Without further delay, the blasting team and the bulldozers were sent in. The rocky outcrop was demolished and the boulders were dumped into the sea to create a new seawall and key for the port extension. God had answered the children's prayers in a remarkable way. The mountain had been moved. They were able to enlarge their building and in due course welcomed 
more children into the orphanage. So yes, God can move mountains, both literally and figuratively. But often, we need to be asking with the right motives. James 4 verse 3 challenges us about this. He writes, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It's an important reminder. Our faith in God should not be based on the false idea that he is some sort of a heavenly penny in the slot machine. Our faith in him is based on the knowledge that he loves us and sacrificed his own son in order to get us out of the mess we make of our lives. Faith is trusting in God that there's a better way, a way to live for him rather than for ourselves, to seek to follow his will rather than fulfill our selfish desires. The only way to do this is to live for Jesus, who died and rose again from the dead in order to give us new life. He asks us to die to our old lives and to follow him. Can we trust him enough to do this? Yes, we can if we believe in him and what he did for us. When you read the Bible, you discover that the word, the word of God, became flesh, became a man, the man, Jesus Christ. You can put your trust in him. You can put your faith in him and you'll not be disappointed. In the process, you'll find that God begins to change your motives. He begins to give you new desires, new faith and a new hope. As Paul writes in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again next Friday. In the meantime, God bless you. And may he build you up in your faith. Bye-bye for now.